What's up guys, welcome back. So in this video, we're gonna talk about Tesla and their business model. We're gonna take a look at the Gigafactories and the Fremont factory and see exactly what's going on at each building. This is important to know where Tesla's at today because if you didn't know, in the future, they plan to be 100% vertically integrated at their Gigafactories and they wanna make that a model that they can then replicate from there. Whether or not we're gonna see this close to 100% vertical integration at Gigafactory 4 in Berlin is to be determined, but Tesla has definitely made steps and they're definitely trending in that direction. You may also not have heard of their Skunk Works facility. We're going to cover that as well, so let's get into it. It all started with the original Tesla Roadster in 2008. Some of them have VIN numbers starting with S, which is the designation for the UK. Others start with the number 5, which correlates with the US. Parts of the Roadster were sourced from around the world, and Tesla contracted with Lotus to build the Roadster's unique chassis. The single-speed gearbox was made in Detroit by a supplier called Berg Warner. Brakes and airbags were made by Siemens in Germany. Clearly, the original Roadster was a piecemeal experiment from all over the world. But for North American customers, the car was assembled in Menlo Park, California, where Tesla employees installed the powertrain, which is composed of the battery pack, power electronics module, gearbox, and the motor. Tesla ended production of the Roadster in 2012. So this leads us to Tesla's first factory, which is creatively called Tesla Factory, the one that's in Fremont, California. So it's a pretty cool story. GM and Toyota actually co-own this plant for a long time. They were producing upwards of a half a million vehicles a year. Then around 2010, the mayor of Fremont actually thought that this plant was dead. There was no use for it. And then in comes Tesla to save the day. They end up taking over this factory in Fremont, which was their first. The initial purchase of the Fremont factory was for $42 million, and Tesla then later purchased $17 million of manufacturing equipment, including spare parts at deep discounts relative to new equipment. The factory is roughly 5.5 million square feet and was originally about 10 times too big for what Tesla needed, and much of the site went unused for the first few years. Fast forward to today, where the facility is close to being fully utilized. The first retail delivery of the Model S happened at this site in June 2012. Today, the Fremont factory is where the Model S, X, and 3 are assembled, and there are over 10,000 employees at this location. In May of 2019, Tesla announced they were going to shuffle production lines at the Fremont factory to make space for the Model Y production. The facility had a production capacity of up to 500,000 cars per year when Toyota and GM were running the plant, and so far, Tesla has achieved a roughly 350,000 capacity production rate with plans to exceed the former number. For years, Tesla had a secret location on the second floor of the Fremont factory to work on battery cell research, but recently it seems as though this has been moved to a facility on Cato Road known as the Skunk Works Lab. This is a few minutes down the street from Fremont. The battery R&D team had been focused on designing and prototyping advanced lithium ion cells as well as new equipment and processes. To date, Tesla has been relying on a partnership with Panasonic for its battery cells, but it seems imminent things will be changing in 2020. And so this moves us to Gigafactory 1, Tesla's first Gigafactory. It's in Reno, Nevada, and it went into construction in 2015, and it's actually still being built out today. And as we'll talk about later in the video, it's still only about 30% built out as of today. However, operations at Gigafactory 1 started in 2016, and they had the grand opening that year in July. At that time, they only had three of the final 21 blocks of the factory built out. It was aligned on True North so the solar panels could be optimized and so eventually the factory can be entirely self-sufficient using solar, wind, and geothermal sources. G1 will have the largest footprint in the world when it's completed. It was built to supply battery packs for both its vehicles and the stationary storage systems. The factory started with limited production of power walls and power packs in 2016, which were previously produced at the Fremont factory. In addition to batteries, G1 was to be the site to build motors and drive units. G1 began mass production of the 2170 lithium ion cells, which are used in the Model 3 in January of 17. These cells were built from Tesla's partnership with Panasonic, and Panasonic does own some of the cell production equipment. So, Gigafactory 1 produces Model 3 electric motors and battery packs in addition to Tesla's energy storage products. Panasonic makes the cells, which Tesla then uses to make battery modules and packs for its cars. 
As of 2019, it's reported that G1 is still only about 35% complete. It should be noted in April of 2019, Elon said their Model 3 production was limited due to battery supply constraints, and G1 was only operating at around two-thirds of its 35 gigawatt hour per year theoretical capacity. This battery supply constraint is a huge deal as Tesla still plans to begin production of the Semi, Roadster, and Cybertruck over the next 24 months. There are no official announcements for where these vehicles will be produced. And so moving on to Gigafactory 2 in Buffalo, New York, uh, this doesn't get much coverage. A lot of people don't know about it, but it's where Tesla is doing most of its solar work. So it's actually in conjunction with Panasonic. And as you'll see soon, it may be shifting into towards more of a Panasonic facility, but let's, let's talk about it. The site was originally a steel manufacturing site, but the 88 acre property has been transformed after Tesla secured the site through the controversial Solar City acquisition in 2016. Tesla plans to create 5,000 clean energy jobs at this site over 10 years. G2 is actually owned by the state of New York and is leased by Tesla's subsidiary, Solar City. It employs around 800 people currently. In May of 2019, Reuters reported G2 has actually functioned more like a Panasonic factory to supply other solar companies. Panasonic invested in the production of solar cells at G2 and Tesla agreed to buy those cells to use in their solar roof tiles that are made at the factory. However, the report said Tesla has only sporadically purchased solar cells made by Panasonic, according to an employee, with the rest going to foreign buyers. In October 2019, Tesla announced version 3 of its solar roof is ready to begin production and installation will ramp up over the next several months. Clearly, there are questions as to what's really going on at G2, and it will be important to watch if Tesla can deliver on its goals for the site. Tesla's solar business has clearly not been a focus of the company the last few years, but this could change moving forward. And so, of course, with Gigafactory 3, we don't have to cover too much because it's been all over the headlines. You probably know it's in China and Shanghai where Tesla's now producing and delivering the Model 3, and eventually they'll also be delivering Model Ys, but there are a few things with regard to battery production and logistics that you might not be aware of. One of the components that Tesla knew would not be ready for local Chinese production were the batteries. So Tesla decided to make the first wave of cars with battery packs shipped from G1 in Nevada. G1 has been supplying battery packs to G3 since the beginning of August. Tesla has been sending between 400 to 750 battery packs per week, depending on what was needed at Fremont at the time. 2019 G3 battery packs were shipped over a period of 12 weeks. The plan is to shift to using LG Chem's 2170 batteries as soon as possible in 2020 and eventually the second building at G3 will be used to make battery packs in-house. These will basically be the same type of 2170 cells that Panasonic produces. LG Chem will do its best to mimic the batteries made by Panasonic. The word mimic I use here since LG Chem has different manufacturing equipment and techniques than Panasonic and the cells will clearly not be identical. Additionally, Tesla determined that the cells made by LG Chem have a slightly lower capacity. There are clear plans to produce batteries, Model 3, and Model Y at G3. Elon did also mention plans to develop an R&D center in China to create a custom Chinese car, something that's a piece of art, like the Cybertruck. In November of 2019, Tesla announced that at its next Gigafactory, G4, which will be in Germany and Berlin, they're going to start with a Model Y. Elon has said that they'll make powertrains and other battery units there, and only time will tell if this is the first Gigafactory where we'll get close to 100% vertical integration for Tesla. And so early expectations for this G4 plant are that it will have capacity of up to 750,000 cars per year, but of course that'll be a couple years down the road after the Gigafactory is opened. The first phase, which can be seen in the lower left corner in this picture, is expected to be completed in July 2021, and it will support the local production of Model Y in Europe. Tesla already confirmed that it plans to eventually build the Model 3 at G4, and it will presumably be one of the three additional sections of the factory. Tesla also disclosed that it plans to build future vehicles other than the Model Y and Model 3 at the factory. Tesla is also planning a battery cell factory on the east side of the plant. Tesla is unlike most other auto manufacturers, as they are already heavily vertically integrated with plans to be as close to 100% as possible. In the short term, this has resulted in a lack of profits for Tesla as they're constantly investing in innovation and new production, but long term this will result in massive supply chain and logistical savings. And so that's why it's so important to kind of watch as Tesla gets closer and closer to doing everything in-house. As I said, short term it costs them a lot more, but long term it's so, so vital for them to be able to grow without any restrictions and to save drastically on all of those manufacturing and logistical supply chain costs. So thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you can leave a like if you enjoyed or if you learned something new and I'll see you guys in the next video.